this is all Billy Graham stuff, by the way. It's going to be 75% Billy Graham, 25% uh, John Collins. So uh, it says, while I agree that baptism is means of grace, as well as a sacrament that all Christians should receive in their lives, <clears throat> I argue that baptism alone does not make a person a Christian nor fit him for eternity in heaven. Now, the key word that Dr. Graham is saying here is that he doesn't believe, and most people don't believe, just because you get baptized, you're, you're a Christian. There's more to it than that. You know, you, you take a shower, you don't put soap on, you still stink. You know, you still got to cleanse yourself. You still got to do the, the appropriate way. Yeah, Charlie, I was talking about you, buddy. <laughs> Down there looking like Santa Claus. Now, Jesus said in John 3, 3, that a person cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless he or she is born again. So how does a person become born again? Now, I agree with the scripture that the author of this article, John, in question, picked John 3, 5, where Jesus said, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he or she is born of water and of spirit. Now, while there are some arguments that the comment about water is speaking about baptism. Others believe Jesus meant one must be born physically through the waters of the womb and spiritually to become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. So the author's claim that baptism makes a person a Christian is not necessarily validated by the use of the scripture. There's more. However, this is the more. Believing that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God, who died on the cross for your salvation. Scripture. Believe that Jesus is the eternal Son, who died on the cross for your salvation. If you do not believe that, if you do not accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you cannot become a Christian. It is impossible. There is no other way. Jesus explicitly says in the Bible, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one goes to the Father except through. At the same time, in his or her life, a person must say yes. You have to say yes to God's offer. Ephesians 1.5, can you put that up? You have to be you have to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Obey the Lord Jesus by listening to what he has said to us through God's holy word and through the promptings of God's holy spirit. If we do not listen to what Christ has already taught us through his word, how can we say we are followers of Christ? We can't. Did the next one happen to go up? Okay. If you love me, you keep my commands. <clears throat> Start your day in the morning. Love. You want to be a Christian? For real. Seriously, everybody in here and everybody wants to be a Christian, right? I'm going to give you some a news flash. You know, like Christian for Dummies. You know that yellow magazine, that book? I'm going to shave your beard. So we're, we're going to go here, right? Love. Easy. Love like Jesus. Would Jesus hate? You want to truly be a Christian? You want to be saved? You have to follow all of these requisites to become a Christian. John 13, 34, new commandment. I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. You can't love somebody and hate them both. You either love them or you hate them. You either have disdain for them or you love them. If you have disdain for them, you can't love them like Jesus does. So then, in other words, you're not following Jesus' command. Love. What a, what a beautiful world we would live in if everybody would just abide just by the Scripture. Love one another. Stop all this gossip and slander and busybodying and 
better than me's and you've got this and he's got to stop it. Love one another. Haven't you guys seen the news? The children getting kidnapped again overseas, the Christians being persecuted again, the earthquakes, the floodings, the, the volcanoes going off. The sign of the times that Revelation described is here. If you're ever going to change, let it be today. But start with this. Love one another. Just love one another. The next one. Put the scripture up, please, for 1 Peter. Live like Jesus. Jesus is, was, and will forever be the Son of God. He was a holy person. A person cannot really be a Christian and live like the world. While none of us is perfect, we should, with the guidance and the help of God's Holy Spirit, move from our old self to becoming new, to be just like Jesus. Oh, how do you be like Jesus? Boom. Love one another. <clears throat> then you should be baptized. See, we've already accepted Jesus Christ. We've already repented our sins. We've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We've agreed to the command that we'll love one another. Now the other part. You should be baptized. But it's not the water that saves. It's God's grace through Jesus Christ. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that any man may boast. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Believe, believe, believe that you are loved and accepted by God. If you are going to take these steps, if you're going to repent your sins, if you're going to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and if you are going to be baptized, the command to love one another, you are taking the most important three steps that you could ever take in your life because you can claim to be a saved Christian. Amen? Folks, I've said this from the giddy up when I started this journey many years ago. A lot of y'all have heard me say this a million times. No matter how good you think you are, we're not good enough. But I will tell you this, there are no, and I want to express this word no, none. There are no 23 and a half hour a day Christians in heaven. You either are one or you're an imposter and you're not. Decide today. Do you want to go to those pearly gates and have Peter open it? Or do you want to go to hell? I don't want to talk about hell. Why? Why? You should. The good news of the Christian faith, your faith, the good news begins with the recognition that you are loved and you are accepted by God who created you and who sustains us in this world. You are loved. <clears throat> Jesus taught us to call God Father. While well, some people may lack the positive experience of the loving parent, most can imagine what the word Father can mean at its very best. It suggests one... Excuse me. That we're one with God. That we understand how much God loves us. But we also understand that, see, we need God. 
And I've said this before. God, well, us without God, is us without God. God without us, he's still God. He's still God. We need to take that important step today to decide that we're going to love one another, we're going to help one another. We're going to get people back on their feet to the kingdom of God, to that glory. But we have to do it. We have to stand up and do it. People keep talking. I've been talking about it for 20 years. Revival. There has gotten, and I know even David Wilkerson in 2008 said in a sermon um, called The Anguish, 2008, November 2008, Times Square Church, said, I've been talking about revival now for 20 years, but I've yet to see a church that really wants to stand up and have a revival. Because they're afraid that the more truth you tell about what it takes to follow Jesus Christ, the more people will go to the bigger churches and forget what the revival was about in the first place. The revival's about redemption. Not just ours, His. But He lived so we could be redeemed. That song, I am redeemed, Big Daddy Weave, I am redeemed. We are all redeemed through the blood of Christ. Amen? We have to, the, the, Bible, the Bible plainly teaches that all human beings have sinned. They've lost their desire to serve God, a lot of them, not all, and have no ability to save themselves. See, we can't save themselves. I talked to Wayne on the phone the other day, and he said somebody in Bible study said, oh, I'm so thankful that Pastor John saved me. Let me give you a little bit of advice about that. I am humanly in, in, incapable of saving anybody. But I know somebody that can. His name is the big J, the big E, the B S, big U, the big S. Jesus can save. John can't. Jesus can. God can. The Holy Spirit can be brought down on you. And you can feel just like they felt that day of Pentecost when they knew what was going on. That fire came down breathing on them. They knew that God himself was in their presence and they were throwing it down like we should be throwing it. <coughs> throwing it down today. We have got to get back to the days of old time religion. Old time religion. We've got to get back to revival. You want justified and sanctified through the body of Christ, through the blood of the Lamb, that that blood that runs down Calvary still today. People say that if you go to that hill in Calvary, you can still hear the tears from all the blood that was shed. If you want all this to change today, revival. We have got to have a good old-fashioned, old-time religion, old rugged cross, get splinters in your head, scream to the top of your lungs, Hallelujah! Praise Jesus! Old time service revival! That's the way it's got to be! <laughs> I'm going to throw this bad boy out, but I'll have two weeks to heal it. <laughs> we can look and find every truth in the Bible. We can look and find out what it takes to be who you need to be and how you need to be it. We can look and we can try to, to like swim, right? We're going to swim through the waves of the ocean. As long as it's not in Panama City right now because there's sharks. I'm not swimming there. And no matter how much you swim, how much you try to separate, it all comes down to one thing. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. Mordecai Ham in Charlotte, North Carolina, September 9th, 1945, said it the best. We're filthy rags. We're just filthy rags. Billy Sunday, 1919, the Salvation Army on the corner, Chicago, Illinois, after a Chicago White Sox baseball game that he happened to be the starting center fielder for. Didn't know that, did you? 
He was one of the best baseball players in baseball, Billy Sunday. He leaves the Comiskey Park every day, sees these people street preaching. I want to know what that's all about, he says. Fastest runner, great batting average, had a little bit of power, but a great baseball player for the Chicago White Sox. He finally keeps hearing them. One day he goes, what happened? What's going on with you guys? How does this happen? I said, it's God. So he goes and around the corner to this Salvation Army in this church, and he gets religion. He walks into Charlie Kaminsky and says, I quit. I don't want to be a Major League Baseball player anymore. I'm going to go win souls for Christ. He's preaching on the corner with Salvation Army, Chicago, Illinois, telling people, balling up his fist, putting it in a baseball bat, swinging it, and says, I'm hitting home runs for God now. I'm going to tell you about sin. I'm going to tell you about glory. I'm going to tell you about that Holy Ghost. But I'm going to tell you about this guy named Jesus. And if you don't listen to me, we're going to have a problem. And he'd shake his fist. Then he'd pow him. That was his big thing. Pow! Those guys did it. And they listened to him. They listened to him. And it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter how many times you talk and preach. People are going to start jumping on your back with everything they can to get you to not talk and preach about a Lord that can save you. About a guy named Jesus that died for you. About how you can get sanctified and justified. How you can get to those pearly gates of heaven. And how one day you can sit on the side of Jesus at the supper of the Lamb. And look at him and go, oh my God. Thank you for all of this blood. <coughs> thank you for... <coughs> thank you for all of those tears. Thank you for everything you went through. You can eat... That dinner with Jesus like they did at the Last Supper. Except here's the big thing, guys. When you're up there doing that, you're never leaving to be disappointed by man again. <laughs> You'll never be disappointed again. It's eternity. In a million years, you're still going to be up there thanking Jesus, loving God, hugging your loved ones, and saying, thank you so much. Thank you so much for what you did for this filthy rag. See, there's a way to take that filth off. It's called coming to the cross. Don't, don't care. Just don't care about anything. Bobby Jones, I'm going to quote people. Bobby Jones in 1963 at an all-black church in Biloxi, Mississippi, comes up and he says, uh, people uh, out in the world, uh, in television land, uh, you want to know uh, what it's like and uh, somebody give me a hallelujah and, uh, and amen. And, uh, but uh, if it isn't uh, for the stripes of the blood of the Lamb, uh, we are all filthy rags. And uh, I will tell you this, that nowhere in this church, nowhere in Biloxi, Mississippi, nowhere in the state of Mississippi as a whole, is there a holier man that ever walked then? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. A strange, as strange as it seems, as strange as it seems, everyone that's ever put a needle in their arm or meth up their nose or a pill in their mouth or a bottle on their lips. Nobody has ever done anything. Man may go, nah, 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 nah. God's going to go, repentance is there. See, God didn't care about that pill and that needle and that drug. He just doesn't. He cares about those R-E-P and T's. He cares about the love of your heart and how to come home. He cares about how you once again, <laughs> look, brother, if there was no such thing as a person backsliding, there'd be no story in the Bible that Jesus said about the prodigal son coming home. But let me tell you about that prodigal son. <clears throat> I told you there's always a story in a story in the Bible. You want to know the story of the story of the prodigal son? Want to know it? 
Nobody went to go get him. He did it on his own. He didn't have to go get prodded and told. He didn't have to go tell, ah, you're a screw-up. <clears throat> there you are. You got nothing. Now, look at me. I'm eating fat on the cow, and I've got all these diamond rings and jewels. And Look how clean and my shiny my robe is. My... Hey, by the way, I got servants. They're bringing me dinner in an hour. What are you eating? I'm eating what the pigs eat. <clears throat> That's how the story goes. Nobody went to him and said, Brother, you made a mistake. You need to go back to your father. Nobody went to him and said, you need, You're erring your way. You need to go fix this. The prodigal son came home because he realized he need, needed to come home. Everyone in this church that's ever swayed on your own. You don't need somebody to tell you. On your own. Come home. Because I want to tell you something. No matter what you've done, no matter that bottle, that pill, no matter what, the R-E-P-N-T, as soon as you do that with pure heart, you know what God's going to tell you? Very simple. Two words. Welcome home. Commit your life to Christ. Faith is another key word in the New Testament used to describe a genuine response to the good news. Accept what God has done by faith. Don't accept God because Brian tells Linda to, or Joni tells Bernie to, or Austin tells Mrs. Carter to, or Jeff tells... or Charlie tells Vicky to. Accept faith because it's something you have personally with God. Don't let somebody else tell you you have faith. You do it. You get your faith. You climb that mountain. You're the only one that knows what pain, agony, and blues you have in your life. They don't. They can't tell you how to get faith. They can't tell you anything. They... <coughs> <clears throat> they can lead you. Pastors, they can't give you faith. They can give a sermon. They can give the biggest five-point benefit of a sermon you've ever had in your life. But if you don't eat it, <clears throat> swallow it, <clears throat> regurgitate it, <clears throat> you can't have faith. Because I can't touch you and say you have faith. You have to get that through him and that cross. And until you do, I know you don't want to hear it, but you don't have faith. If somebody else is convincing you that you have faith, guess what, Jack? You have no faith. Actually, you don't have anything. Because if somebody else can persuade you that easily, you're nothing. Get it yourself. <laughs> You've got to decide on your own about faith. I can give you a million stories in that Bible about how people came to faith. I can give you another million of things I've studied just in the book of Josephus and Nicodemus and all the theological books of, of Caiaphas and the books of the Sanhedrin and the lost gospels of Thomas and Mary and Judas and all the books of, of, just, of Pontius Pilate, Hezekiah. I can go through all of those lost books and I could read every one of them. I could educate you on what those people thought and how they found themselves in the glory of God. But until you believe it, you'll never achieve it. Until you absolutely believe and bleed the same blood that Jesus bled and get those proverbial stripes on your own, you will never have true, unadulterated faith. It has to be something you get. We can lead you. But we can't make you do it. You've got to do that on your own. It can't be force-fed you because sooner or later you'll resent it. But when you feel the power of Jesus and you feel the power of God and you feel the Holy Spirit come upon your life, I promise you, you will never, and I mean never, you will never be the same. You're a different person. You're a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5.17. That's what they're talking about. When you have faith and you believe, 
and you accept. You are a new creature. You are a new creation. All things are possible with Christ. Nothing is possible with man without Christ. You understand? <clears throat> Live in a gratitude of God. Christian living involves a transformation of our whole lives out of gratitude to God. In Reformed churches, obedience to the law of God in the Ten Commandments is seen as an opportunity to express thanks for God and what He's done, right? Thanks for God. Read your Bible daily. Don't be content to just skim it. Read it. Learn the secret of prayer. You know what the secret of prayer is? Don't pray something that you heard somebody else pray. Pray. The secret to prayer is you talking to God yourself. You tell God what you want, not what he wants. He's already prayed to God. God already knows what he wants. Let God know how you feel. That's called building a personal relationship. Build a personal relationship with God. And then watch God work. He will answer you. Sometimes you may not like it. Sometimes it may be slow. And sometimes it may be no. But he will answer you. Just give him the opportunity to do so. But form a personal relationship with him. Amen? Rely on the, on the Holy Spirit. Pray. Everybody ever prayed and got the goosebumps or the hair standing up on their hands, that funny feeling in their stomach? That's the Holy Spirit talking to you. Everybody raise their hand on most. That's the Holy Spirit talking to you, telling you everything's going to be all right. Here's another big one. You ready? <clears throat> I am a firm advocate. Attend church. Get into the body of Christ together as a unit, as a whole, as a body. But get here. People out there, if you're close enough, get here. Would you tell me last Sunday, you guys drive 45 minutes one way to get here. Get here. Amen. Be a witnessing Christian. Now, we witness in two ways, by life and by word. Be a witnessing Christian. Let the love of God be shown through you. Not fake, genuine. We go back to that command, love. Love, love, love. Be obedient, always, always. No matter what you think, no matter what you do, always put Christ first. Christ first in the center of your life will change your life, but you have to put Christ first. Amen? <clears throat> Believe in the authority of the Scripture. Experience the power of prayer. Know the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Focus on the cross. Prioritize personal evangelism. Prepare yourself for the future of being in the kingdom of God. Because one day, if we're doing our jobs right, if these pastors are doing their jobs right, one day, one day, you will be in the presence of God. And I hope that God, when we get there, goes, you know, for a cat in a cowboy hat, you did all right. You did all right. You helped these people. That's what we want. That's what we have to do. And you know what else we have to do? We have to tell God if he was here right now, he would say, Love you guys. I'll see you in a week and a half.